All right. Good morning, everyone. It's the November 9th, 2020 meeting of the full RTD Accountability Committee. And um, do we need to introduce ourselves real quickly to see who's on the line? I've already forgotten how we normally do this. Crystal, is that what we normally do? Yeah, let's, let's spend a couple of minutes doing that. Okay, Elise Jones, Boulder County, your co-chair, along with my other co-chair. Uh, Crystal Murillo, Aurora City Council, esteemed co-chair of this committee. <laughs> and of the esteemed committee, all right. Um, why don't we just- It might be easier just to have one person call all the names and see who we forgot. All right, oh. Kathy. Kathy. Kathy Nesbitt. Rebecca. Here. Ndeya. Here. Rut. Present. Julie. Here. And we have um, our two RTD board liaisons, Lynn. I'm here. And Troy. Good morning, all. Thank you. So it looks like, and Kristen is, is here, but not on camera. Kristen, are you still with us? I am here. My camera is once again being remedial. Did All not right. want to get up this morning. I apologize. <laughs> no worries there. And I, I, I think, um, was it Chris or Dan said they weren't going to make it this morning? Yeah, Dan's in uh, begging for funds from one of the local yep. supporters of the flight rail. And of course, Doug Rex and Matthew Helfen. Are on, absolutely. Okay. Did we miss anybody? All right, let's just dive right in and um, see if there's anybody that would like to provide public comment. We don't really have a member of the public, do we? Yes, they didn't want to get up at 8.30 either. I guess that does <laughs> sort of curve the input, doesn't it? <laughs> no, we do. At least, uh, at least we actually have, there's 17 that are um, not on the committee that are on the call, just FYI. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, then let's um, then I, I don't know, Melinda, if you can help me to see if anybody uh, on the call would like to provide up to three minutes of public comment for Absolutely. either of the items on our agenda. Yep. Uh, so what I'll do first is I'll open up the lines to see if there's anyone on the phones. Uh, if there is anyone that's called in for public comment, you'll just need to hit star six now to unmute yourself. Is that a three minute comment? It's a three minute comment and it's focused on the two items on our agenda around legislative concepts and governance model or any of the subcommittee reports, I, so, I suppose. Okay. Um, I don't think I'm hearing anyone on the phones and I don't see any hands raised. So uh, I think it's safe to say that we don't have public comment at this time. Okay, well. With that, then uh, moving on to the uh, meeting summary of the October 19th meeting. We don't really have to approve this, but um, is there any corrections that need to be made? All right, hearing none, we'll move on to subcommittee reports. Rhett, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Uh, on our October 7th meeting of the Finance Subcommittee, we had a discussion of, in a presentation that provided a straw man proposal for how RTD might play a key role in COVID-19 virus vaccinations. We also discussed how critical rapid Colorado vaccinations were to RTD's economic recovery. On our October 21st meeting, we reviewed additions to that uh, straw man proposal and agreed to move forward with external discussions on the feasibility of the concept. This week, I plan to meet with Casey Wolf, the governor's senior advisor on the COVID crisis, and CDPHE's Diana Herrero, who is leading the vaccine distribution planning effort. Next Monday, I'll meet with RTD Chief Engineer Vishwakarma and Ge Assistant General Managers Bill Van Meter and Mike Meter to discuss the feasibility of RTD logistical support. Jennifer Brandenberry provided a comprehensive summary of Colorado statutes related to RTD. 
Doug Retz, Rex, Lynn Geisinger, and Bill Soros also contributed background to these issues. On our November 4th meeting, we had a presentation from CDOT's Brian Metzer on the implementation and ongoing development of CDOT's financial dashboard. RTD CFO Heather McKillop also provided background on RTD's work in this area. A financial dashboard might be an effective way of increasing transparency as well as sharing financial and operational information. We also had a presentation from Rebecca White and Natalie Shishido on potential RTD peer agencies to be considered for comparative analysis. And we have a follow-up video web discussion planned for this afternoon. We closed with an in-depth discussion of potential legislative changes that could provide RTD with greater freedom and flexibility in recovering from the current economic and pandemic crises. That's it. That's all I got done. That's, a, that's it? <laughs> that's great. Thanks so much, Rut. Are there any questions for Rut? All right, let's move on to governance. Julie, do you want to give a quick report? Yeah, sure. So um, our last meeting, we actually had a really good presentation from LA Metro, and they were talking about our sub -regional, their sub-regional service councils, and just kind of like their process and evolution of their organization, which I thought was really helpful. And we were able to ask a lot of questions um, about how the service councils work, who are the members of the service councils, um, any of the above. And so that really ties into number six of the agenda discussion topic today. So, um, you know, we could chat about that more in just a second, but, um, you know, it was a, a really great opportunity for us to um, have them on the line and have that conversation with them and ask questions directly. So I really appreciate staff um, and, and Doug for, for setting that up for us because that was very, very beneficial conversation. All right, questions for Julie. All right, thanks for that, Julie. And Daya, why don't you talk about the operations subcommittee and what you all have been up to? Sure, so the operations subcommittee met on November 4th. Um, we had a brief presentation by Matthew Helfent with Dr. Cog on the RTD, the current RTD fare structures, and then um, some of the um, work that was done back in 2017 from the past program working group. The majority of our time was really honing in on what our potential recommendations would be um, for this committee to consider as we have our year-end report do. Um, the committee itself really wrestled with a few questions. One, focus on a simplified fare structure to help increase ridership, but also promote um, operational efficiency for RTD. Um, we spent quite a bit of time um, looking, or at least discussing some potential unintended consequences of a, a simplified fare structure. I think the one thing that the committee really landed on was that um, regardless of where we are, a simplified structure that is fair and simple, F-A-I-R and simple, um, is critical for us. Um, a couple of things that popped out were around the administrative and operational costs. So there's some coordination <laughs> with the finance subcommittee as we think about what that um, internal cost is for RTD. Um, we also talked about um, what simplified pass structures look like. So thinking about the NICO, the neighborhood eco pass and the eco pass and what their role is going to be in the short term recovery from COVID-19 and the longer term economic recovery in our region. Um, I think where we left off as a committee um, was thinking about the the operations and the um, route structures and how that might support uh support the fair and passes so that's going to be our next step and then there's a few next steps for us to follow up internally with rtd staff to help us better understand um, what the challenges are in terms of um fares and passes during covid so that's our report wonderful any questions for daya all right with that we will turn it over to sort of the meat of the go to the meeting of the agenda and I'm going to turn it over to my co-chair to run the rest of the meeting. Okay, thank you, Elise. Um, so yes, thank you to our subcommittee chairs for 
folks who are just tuning in um, and haven't in a while, we decided to transition to um, have subcommittee chairs to kind of help with our efficiency with these meetings. Um, and I think they have gone very well. Um, so again, thanks to our subcommittee chairs. Um, the next agenda item that we have um, is legislative concepts. And I'm gonna turn that over to Elise and Rhett to talk a little bit more about the document that they uh, provided. Let me just give a context, and I'm going to turn it over to Rutt to go through the provisions. We accidentally both uh, took on the same assignment independently and wrote documents, and I, that's the bad news because there was two documents that looked awfully alike. Good news is we pretty much agreed on everything, so um, there's three major provisions that both of us hit on, and then I hit on a fourth one, and then um, so maybe Rutt can go through the, the three. I'll hit on the fourth one. And then I'm going to ask the RTD board members to chime in on if there's additional ones that came forward and uh, see if there's any sort of growing consensus on this. So, Rut, why don't you um, take it away on, on the, the, the core three that you identified in your memo? Sure. Well, when the governor and the legislature established this committee, one of our key assignments was a determination of the long range financial stability of the agency and how the agency can achieve stability and growth while still meeting its core mission. But this emergence of the COVID pandemic has forced RPD to reduce services by 40% while encountering a 60% you know, reduction in ridership and a major decline in sales and, re and use tax revenues. So, Right now, you know, our $6 billion rail network is carrying fewer than a third as many riders as it did in 2019. So, you know, the idea of that core mission is pretty hard to get back to unless we can find ways to, to recover where we are. And part of this is, you know, some relief from some of the legislation, legislation constraints on RPD. And so what we have here are some suggestions uh, that that we would like to uh, move on and show and discuss with RTD uh, because some of the ideas that we'd like to, to look into are really blocked by language in the statutes. And so uh, these statutes were written 50 years ago and things are quite a bit different now. Of course, they've been amended along the way. It's difficult sometimes to pin down specific changes, uh, but there are some broader things that we think can be done. Uh, if you look at, at uh, 39.9.119.7 of the statutes, uh, it's the fare box recovery ratios. And, and if you look at how we're going to get back to expanding ridership and try to recover our ridership, uh, it's going to take some out-of-the-box thinking in terms of how we accomplish some of this, I suspect it doesn't fit in very well with the current statutes so um, we we really need to come up with ways that we're going to be able to recover that ridership because that is really what rtd is about it's about moving people and if we can't move enough people then we're not really hitting our primary mission as as an agency so uh there are a variety of different things that are entailed in this uh there are things we can do to attract customers. Uh, for example, one of the things that's come up is in the vaccination side, we might say, all right, well, if you vaccinate, we'll give you a 30-day pass on RTD. That's a nice perk to get them to vaccinate, but it's also a way to get some of these riders back on our, on our buses and on our rail. Uh, and it's nice that they would be vaccinated people. We might even think about using certain rail cars that are for just vaccinated people, for example, to really, really be able to get our ridership up. Because with social distancing right now, it's almost impossible to get anywhere near our previous ridership. So I, I believe that uh, to accomplish that, we should request that the entire article 32 section 9 119.7 just be removed from statutes. I will say that Elise took a, what might be a smarter route in the legislature and that's to take certain things out of that. But if you take enough out of it, there's really not much left and it may be that it, we could get them to just completely eliminate that. 
Arky, he may have some something to say about that as well. So we want to we want to hear from them. Uh, it also in that section has a, a quite a bit about reporting on budgetary, financial, and operational details. It's it's kind of our thought that if we could get a really good uh, uh, dashboard going for RTD, then a lot of those things would not only be be uh, reported through that, they would be reported in more like real time. And so that might be a that might be a, a real benefit. And and the same thing with everything from fare box ratios to uh, annual reports of financials and all of that, and monthlies as well. So that was the first one. The second one is the provision of retail and commercial goods and services at district transfer facilities, residential and other uses at district transfer facilities permitted, which is 119.8. And there's a lot of really broad language about you can't compete with businesses that are reasonably near a transfer facility. Well, what's reasonably near? You know, any any commercial entity could come up if we started something, for example, like a, a little store where people could pick up things on their way home or something like that at the really busy uh, transit centers, then we wouldn't be running that. An independent business entity would have to run that, which is fine. That's how it should be. We don't want to get all these other businesses, but we would derive some revenue from that. And it's a real benefit to, to our riders as well. But a lot of the language in here would really put any company that thought they might want to do that, uh, they would open them up to potential lawsuits and uh, it just gets really messy. So we feel like that paragraph needs to be removed as well. Uh, in addition to that, uh, 119.8 subparagraph 5 uh, may pr prevent RTDs permitting development of transit focused residences due to some of the restrictions, in particular the parking ratio restrictions. There was a study by Seth Goodman and some other people that looked at a medium, medium two bedroom US city code requirement and it was about one and a half parking spaces that's more than half the area of a typical two-bedroom apartment and it adds about $375 a month to rent and that unnecessary parking space if we're trying to really create transit-oriented development uh, really puts it puts us at a significant financial disadvantage more importantly it puts the people that we're trying to to create low-income housing or housing for, for dis, the disabled community, disabled folks at a real disadvantage as well. It adds a lot to the cost of that. And the person building that, because they've got to sell those or lease those in order to, to be uh, able to make money. So if we really want to focus on transit-friendly residences, then we need relief from some of these, some of these local zoning ordinances. And then finally, the limited authority. Pardon? Uh, do you mind if I chime in on that second um, point? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So I, you know, we in our conversations around um, this particular point around transit-oriented development, and I'm putting my city council hat back on. We, you know, we had committed to an equity kind of lens in this conversation. And when I when I think about that, I, I also, um, you know, it. I wanted to just share this with the public about where the conversation kind of what, what we're thinking about not entirely sure where it fits or if it fits in in statute as is but um you know just because we make development cheaper does not equate to there being cheaper cheaper product so i, I wanted to just make that clear and of course we have developers who specialize in affordable trans, uh, transit-oriented development. Um, but I hear time and time again that from several developers that, you know, they just don't know how or they aren't willing to. Um, so I just, I, I, for, for equity's sake, when we talk about transit-oriented development, part of the benefit to a municipality in developing transit-oriented development is, is mutually beneficial. One, we are providing riders right at the feet of um, you know, some of this uh, transit development, um, but 
additionally that they're it's serving people who actually use and have a need for um, light rail or RTD services, right? Because we can create housing at a transit oriented development that um, is at a price point at a demographic that doesn't necessarily use RTD services. So um, when we think about equity and what kind of development we're trying to put there, you know, it's unclear to me at this point, um, but it was, you know, part of our conversation of where that would need to go. Cause I, I'm, I'm for making things more efficient, but um, not at the expense of things actually truly being affordable. And I, you know, I think that's something we'll have to continue to explore, but um, just wanted to add that in, uh, you get a really good summary um, about kind of the, the main point, but the, as like a sub point and um, kind of bringing into call, call our equity charge, um, felt the need to kind of share that. That's good, thank you. Thank you, Crystal. Hey. Uh, Chris, do you want to speak to this? I just wanted to say, uh, well, it, it can be separate. I'm still not quite sure, Crystal, that I follow what you're saying. So, um, but I don't want to derail, Rut, your, your agenda item for this morning. So we can, I just am not understanding. I'm not saying right or no. wrong. I, I just don't understand, so. Yeah, oh, I'm I, just saying I, that I, cheaper, cheaper cost is not equal cheaper rents or cheaper like out end product for the consumer. Uh, in a more, national uh, more expensive cost certainly doesn't either. And it for more sure, and that's exactly. So yeah. I think one of the flaws in a lot of uh, how how we've done affordable housing and how we've looked at this problem is is that you get a parking space whether you're going to use it or whether you want it or anything else or not and you pay for that and it goes into the cost of building that property and if we can find a way where they don't get a parking space for free but in some cases they can choose and we limit that parking then it will move more of them over we can also build in rail passes into that property if if it is a, a negotiated issue between RTD and the developers. We want to build transit friendly, but also pre uh, we want to build affordable housing for transit dependent populations, and that needs to be the focus. And if we can and would, and eliminate that the cost of that parking, we really can save money all the way around. Developers have to make money on these on these properties, or they're not going to build them. But there is a way for them to do that, and also for us to save a lot of money. And it also taking those cars off the road has a great environmental impact. Elise, I know you wanted to comment here. Well, I just would add, uh, coming from a county that has a housing authority that builds a lot of um, affordable housing, I think the key is if you want to create an incentive for truly affordable housing, you're going to have to make it permanently affordable. And there's, and that's a whole, I think the question is whether or not we are going to suggest that that TOD at transit stations um, focus on affordable housing, in which case there need to be incentives and mechanisms to assure that it's truly affordable. Right, you're entirely right that uh, unbundling parking and having fewer parking spots so that you don't actually have to pay for parking if you don't need it helps lower the cost. But if we don't actually um, uh, lock in that affordability over time, it will get flipped and, and it will escalate. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll move on now to the, the third one that I was uh, uh, discussing, which is the whole fees for parking, reserve parking spaces, penalties. There's a whole lot of micromanagement in this in this paragraph of RTD and how they manage their uh, their parking. I, I you know RTD built it, they paid for it. Having the micromanagement of the legislature on the details of how it's how it's managed, I think is is unnecessary and and puts RTD at, a, at an economic disadvantage. So my argument is we ought to just get rid of that piece altogether. Okay, that's that's uh, all I had to say. But Elise, you have some differences in how you're you're doing things and all that. It would probably be useful for you. And then we don't have the uh, the uh, fifty eight percent issue discussed right. because I ran out of time. <laughs> that's fine. I let me jump in and just mention that the the other idea um, of a legislative uh, a statute that we might consider amending, and this is. Um, 
the provision in uh, CRS 32-9-119.5. Um, and that's, it. Re this is a provision that requires RTD to provide up to 58% of the um, vehicular sister assist uh, service, excuse me, to qualified private businesses to run. And the statute um, goes on to talk about some of the details around that. But the key being that RTD is required to contract out 58% of the businesses and <clears throat> of its business. And the I, I, ideally, um, assuming that uh, the provisions around labor force and workforce are, are comparable, RTD should be, uh, be, being led by whatever's the most cost-effective option rather than setting a percentage in statute. It's not clear how constricting this is, but it is micromanagement and it provides a limitation. So I um, highlighted that as something that we might want to change. And you'll see in the, the second document, I actually provide legislative um, you know, strikeouts and add-ins on, on how it could be and just say, you know, continue the authorization for RTD to um, work with qualified businesses to provide service, but not dictate a per percentage to allow them to um, implement a system that uses some. Since then, um, the um, feedback, got some feedback in that suggested we should um, specify that that could be nonprofit entities as well as businesses. Um, for those of you who are familiar with um, outfits like VIA, that's a transit provider, but it's a nonprofit transit provider, um, and that that should also be allowed, but again, not dictated, so that we could be guided by cost effectiveness. So that's the fourth provision. Um, and I also wanted to, I know Lynn and Troy have been in discussions with RTD staff about provisions that RTD has been looking at that that are um, unnecessarily limiting and there might be some additional ones that that they want to bring to our attention so Lynn do you want to chime in sure um, I think that was all a great summary I'll just quickly talk about the the TOD the um, planning staff has uh, recently brought to to board and we met in smaller groups just kind of a working thing, but um, the idea of, of putting in place an, an ETOD program, which is an equitable TOD program. And they're looking at some of the things you were talking about, which is uh, moving away from the one-to-one -one parking requirement that you'd have to have to replace all the parking, just a huge cost. Um, <clears throat> looking at quicker review times at, um, uh, well, there's a calculation in the, I think this is in the statute that RTD is required to get fair market value. Um, we could do that by saying that um, affordable housing is a benefit for fair market value. But um, if I'm right that that's in the statute, removing that requirement too um, would be helpful. So it is um, a focus of uh, you know the staff and the board right now to uh, to try to promote equitable TOD on the same theory that Crystal raised that um, uh, people in more affordable housing are more likely to use our our services. Um, well, that theory and also just um, supporting the idea of affordable housing. Um, <clears throat> I think, uh, you know, I think, again, Troy and I are not at, at this point speaking for the board or the agency. Um, so what, what we can tell you is um, kind of the conversations we've had with, with staff in a sense. And I think that, that overall, um, Flexibility is good. You know, if we can uh, um, remove some of the restrictions, none of these are going to make us a ton of money. None of these are going to be um, big, earth-shaking changes. But, um, but you know, as, as Elise and Rhett mentioned, all of these provide some more flexibility. Parking is another one that um, is, I think, probably one of the more important just giving the board and the staff the ability to manage the parking, you know, if there's, if they want to move people around from one spot to another or want to, uh, you know, lower fares in exchange for raising parking or something, I don't anticipate, you know, the board and the staff are all very aware that, um, you know, raising parking is a little like raising fares. So, uh, you know, it, it's not, 
I don't anticipate any big changes there, but getting the flexibility makes recovery, the, makes sense. The fare box recovery um, Rhett handled that well. In addition, it's really just a meaningless um, requirement because they throw in um, grants, grant money as part of the fare box. I think depreciation may be in there. You know, it's just, um, it's not uh, a system that, uh, not a requirement that you see in the transit world. Um, and then there's been mention of two other statutes and I need to go back to staff to really flesh these out, but I mentioned them to Elise. The one is that there's, um, there's a limitation on RTD's ability to go back to the voters for TABOR for debrucing, for instance. Um, part of our TABOR exemption, part of RTD's TABOR exemption will expire in 2024. The statute says RTD can only go to the voters in odd number of years. Um, and I think that, uh, again, I need to go back and talk to them, but it, it was mentioned that, that uh, it would be better to, to have more flexibility there. And then finally, um, just one other one that, again, I'm not, totally up to speed on, but uh, the fair evasion fines and process. Right now, you know, if somebody is ticketed, it goes into the local courts, the money goes to the local jurisdiction, and that may be worth looking at, but um, you know, I need to get more information on that one. I think that's all I have. Um, Troy? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. This is Dea. I had a quick question on the fair evasion. Is that within the statute or is that within board policy? I guess that's... I'm yeah. pretty sure that's a statute. Okay. Yeah. That's all I have. Yeah. I, I don't... I have no idea why the, it would be done that way, but that's a good one to look at. So part of what we... I think we really need to do here is we need to get our our side of what we think needs to be done together and then and then work with the board and and work with rtd to say what is it that you really want what would help you what would give you more flexibility we've got a deep hole here to dig out of and we really need and i think the legislature is responsive to the to the idea that there may be some major changes here and while we're we've got them in that position let's take advantage of it I think it is worth highlighting again that this is the, that while it's important that we're doing this statute review in order to provide more flexibility and get rid of obstacles, this is not the financial answer. And the the legislature and our stakeholders will look askew at us if we say, "Oh, this is this is the answer." It is not the answer. It's one mm -hmm. of many improvements that we need to encourage to happen in order to uh, make RTD stronger and more sustainable. Um, and the reason that the timing of this is that we have the opportunity to put a pre preliminary um, report out to the governor and the legislature at the end of the year, and the timing would work well to include this piece in it, but we should not um, set expectations that this is somehow the, you know, the silver bullet. I, I would like to know from Lynn and Troy how we've been talking about this for several weeks. And I don't know why RTD is not officially responding to us. Do we need to just send them a letter to say, here's what we're thinking? What do you think? Um, I feel like we're, we're sort of waiting and for them. And what's the best way in order to get an official response from them on anything else that they want us to look at and whether or not they agree with our focus areas? Do you have a it, sense? It's underway. Yeah. And actually, we only got something written, was it last week, um, you know, for RTD to respond to. And, uh, you know, we've, I, the staff has uh, written up something and reflected in what I was saying that, you know, I think uh, all of those statutes that you're looking at and these other two potentially um, make sense. Uh, actually, what they said was the TOD statute probably doesn't need changing, but I think, you know, I don't think anybody would oppose <laughs> getting additional flexibility um, uh, on that one. Um, so. Uh, you know, it's just a matter, like I said, we, we just got something with, with the accountability committee's position and um, we'll get that to the, get that finalized and to the staff, I mean, to the board soon. So we should be able to give you an official position. And I think the legislature will understand that this is not the solution. This is just the beginning of the solution. This is a, 
a necessary but not sufficient condition. All of, or most of these at least were in SB 151, which was had a ton of other stuff in it last year. And um, while it didn't go fully forward because of the pandemic and other problems with it, uh, there was not really uh, notable opposition to these changes in the legislature. Good. Yeah, yeah, that's good to know that there there might be potential to kind of pick that back up um, in this next legislative session. So maybe we're reaffirming and maybe simplifying that um, lengthy bill. Um, I think what I'd also like to add to the conversation is um, what, uh, the, the, the idea of um, a land trust. Um, I, I know that that is its own financial, you know, setup, but it's not uncommon amongst affordable housing developers to um, use to to separate the value and cost of the land versus the value and the cost of a brick and mortar, of the brick and mortar. And so when we talk about um, things being affordable in perpetuity, things like uh, Habitat for Humanity. Um, um, often implement that type of tool. So I think um, that also might be worth considering as well, because again, it's not like a local government can develop the land, you know, that's not our expertise, but if we could figure out a way to make the, the value of the land lower, um, I think it serves developers and the municipalities well um, by making whatever development cheaper. Um, and then we can have a conversation around um, what price needs to be, what, what pricing um, for these units and preferably in my opinion, mixed income units, um, you know, where that profit can go and, and kind of, you know, have that negotiation. And so, um, I, I, you know, land trust product um, and that's, I think, um, late, larger cities like the city of Aurora are having conversations around affordability. And it's just really hard for local governments to compete um, and not compete in development, but compete with the ability to build affordability when we have to compete with developers who do this for a living, right? Who know how to land bank ahead of time, who can get ahead of the curve when we're just trying to provide affordability. That's something that we're running into. So I'd like to see that um, introduced to the conversation um, and see how we might explore that, whether or not that actually happens. You know, that's part of a larger process, but land trust, land banking, I think are all tools that affordable housing developers are familiar with. Yeah, this is Dan. I just wanted to jump in really quickly. I, I plugged a recommendation or at least something for us to consider as we flesh out these legislative options, but especially around the ETOD. Um, and I recognize, you know, that at least from this the staff it may not it's kind of a nice to have in terms of legislative um modifications but i do think some sort of right, right of first refusal or opportunity for community serving organizations nonprofits affordable housing developers that are interested in acquiring property that they have the first um opportunity to to purchase certain property um because i think that's certainly been lifted up in the past among our community as a challenge um, because oftentimes they're competing with at market rate developers or others um, so having that provision within the statute has been really limiting for community serving organizations that are really focused on keeping folks in place and commu keeping community services in place so i just want to offer that as as something that i'd like to have us consider you know i think one of the things we really need to do here before we get <clears throat> too far in this is to sit down with some developers and really understand what it is we can do. There you go, Chris. We're, we and, are and, sitting down with one. How about first of all, that? I know some people that fall in this category, but I think that, that that's probably where a lot of the development would come from. And we need to we need to understand how to get them enthusiastic about doing this kind of, of uh, low income housing development. And we need to understand what their barriers are as well. So. Can I add in here? Because it's fascinating and, and great topic. I'm just I'm worried it takes us too far away from the topic of of trying to help RTD out, because um, they are not in the business of building affordable housing. Um, that is that's not the mission of that organization. So um, I just want to make sure we don't uh, end up down a rabbit hole that is really not within the purview of this committee. I think it's a it is it is a long term issue. 
And it's also an issue for the benefit of the people that we serve, especially those transit dependent populations. And so I think it's a legitimate issue. We're not gonna be the ones doing this. We're basically just trying to make it possible for RTD to be able to do these things more efficiently. But you're right, this does not, in the near term, it doesn't put another rider on, on our RTD transit system. But in the long term, I think it, it could be it could be powerful. And again, what we want to do is just make it possible for RTD to be able to do some things like this more easily. And you're right, we can't really put pour too much into this. Ben, were you going to say something? Yeah, um, I was just going to see if, if uh, Bill Saroy maybe could address this. They, they're working hard on this equitable TOD program, um, and it might be helpful for you to hear from him. I know he's on the line. Is that okay? Bill? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. So, yeah, I just wanted to just to address this a little bit because, you know, one thing I'll say is we have a long history of working with the development community and long history of working with a lot of affordable housing developers. I think what we're doing with our ETOD policy with the board is trying to recognize it and make it kind of a board statement or policy that we want to encourage um, affordable housing around our stations. And again, the one thing I also want to point out is, and I know Chris would, would uh, reflect on this too, is that you know RTD in and of itself is going to have a minimal influence on TOD around stations because we have a minimal amount of land. Most of the development that we see is on other people's land. It's not on our land. And, and frankly, when we get involved with TOD on our land, it's very complicated. And we're trying to make it a little less complicated, especially those with affordable housing with regards to the parking requirements and some other things. But I just want to make sure it's it's not one, I think that we can we can address affordable housing and make it hopefully make it more of a priority on some of our property. But I still think there's going to be it, it is going to have a, some impact, but not a huge amount. Just because we in you know in our look at this, you know, we have you know, 80 some stations that we have, but you know, there's only probably maybe about 20%, 15 or 20% of those that actually probably have some opportunity for development. And of those, it may not, all those may not be affordable housing either. So I just want to make sure that we understand the potential impact of this. It is, there is an impact, but it's not going to be this move the needle kind of thing. Um, and we are doing this because, again, our board has expressed a, a lot of interest in this and we're moving forward with this. And we can bring a future presentation if we'd like about what this engages. I know that Dea, we've we've had some conversation with her about this, but we can give you a little bit more information. But I just want to make sure that I, I the expectations are set here. Hey, Bill, is when you say there's only limited opportunity for development, are you referring also to surface parking lots? Um, no, I'm, re I'm referring because I think to, that's what I know that that's the affordable housing instance in Boulder County that I'm aware of where we talk with RTD we all wanted to do something better than a huge service parking lot for RTD members but the replacement for 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 developing on that land is to, to build a parking lot garage and that became a you know, cost prohibitive so the parking piece of it I think RTD has a lot of parking RTD doesn't charge for the parking. It's a huge subsidy and a huge cost, and that land could be better served potentially. So I think that's where there might be some opportunities. Again, it's there's no silver bullets here, but there's opportunities to increase um, affordable TOD near near stations that would then help increase ridership. Yeah, no, yeah, and that's one of the things that we are trying to address in terms of the replacement parking because I do think that is. A barrier. It's fair not only to affordable housing, but it's a fair to any development on our deep property. Um, but what I, when I was saying limited ability, I'm saying that you know of the stations that we have, we only have a smaller subset that we think fit in that tier of saying something that's going to be developed in the next five to ten years. So most of most of the land that we have, either for various reasons, whether it be um, the market, whether it be um, other barriers um, that are out there, um, really. Are, are going to be challenged just with getting something done. So I'm, I just want to make sure that we establish this expectation in terms of what's real and what's, you know, probably not going to happen for a while. Got it.
Well, here right. we're talking about legislation that would provide the flexibility to be able to do some of these things without having to run up against legislative barriers. Yeah. And so we're not talking about developing these properties. We're just basically talking about giving greater flexibility to RTD. Yeah, so I think the conversation has been relevant. I mean, I think we've had a few tangents here and there just kind of ideating on some of the things, but um, to, to the, I guess, core of the conversation around how do we give RTD the flexibility to um, do what it needs to do to address certain, you know, development or different types of areas that were outlined by um, Elise and Rhett. Um, I think has been relevant conversation. So thank you everyone for your input. Um, we've had both Elise and uh, Rutt go through kind of their proposed changes. I just wanna give one more um, opportunity to, to chime in. Um, we do need to um, probably move on to the next agenda item, but um, does anyone have any additional thoughts that they wanted to include at this time? Hey, Crystal, I just have a point of clarification. So what are the next steps um, here for this particular item? What, where, where are these recommendations going? Are they going to go to the RTD board for their Example, feedback? Yeah, um, we can get some uh, concrete steps, but it, it sounds like we're waiting for feedback from RTD staff um, or, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Elise, um, or, or to our RTD representatives. Um, so that's where we're at now. I would say that we need to, there needs to stop being a rut and a lease document and there needs to be, we'll merge that into an accountability committee document, yep. get feedback from, from RTD and see if then we can't put together a sort of final proposed piece that this committee can give its blessing to. And I guess I would suggest that um, it be a part of, if we're doing a um, interim report to sort of uh, to the governor and legislature that it be a part of that along yeah. with our if we make progress on our governance structure proposal even if it's just tentative here's the work we're doing this is the direction we're headed we want to flag these issues um and, and it becomes an opportunity for public and stakeholder feedback as well but i guess i would i i think that's the document um that we would deliver this to at the end of the year deliver this end at the end of the year. I, yeah, I would so add to that. To that, flesh that out the, one more. Oh, I'll, sorry. I'd like to add one thing to that. The legislature's in session coming up in January, January 6th. And there's a window of opportunity there that it would, that if, if you don't essentially get bills in that session, then this committee is not going to really be able to drive any of that process. And so I think that in terms of, of giving greater flexibility to RTD while this committee is a sitting committee and operating, let's let's uh, take that opportunity and try to try to actually get something done this session. May need to be amended or may need to be changed in the next session, but uh, I think that I, RTD has already been thinking about this quite a bit and merging all these ideas together, we should in our interim report say these are the things that we need to get done. Yeah, that's, um, I think, from a strategic standpoint, right, you make a really good point. And even sooner than that, right, our legislators get their top five bills approved by, by leadership by a certain date, right? So I think aligning with that timeline, um, if it's a prerogative of any of our um, legislators um, to kind of get their attention as well. But yeah, I would agree that this is translated into that initial documentation, right? That was our entire push in trying to um, push something, some recommendations before um, the next year. Um, I just wanted to get some clarification to Julie's point. When we talk about getting RTD's approval, I mean, I kind of think of the RTD board and RTD staff as kind of separate processes. Um, Lynn, Troy, do you have any thoughts on um, how that might go um, or if you think they should be separate um, or not? I'm not sure I'm overly concerned about that. Um, you know, our staff has been tracking this. You know, they've been hesitant to insert themselves into the legislative conversations, at least in the early portions of this, because we wanted, you know, to to let this committee do, um, you know, a, an independent analysis. 
I know that the staff, uh, they're on it and um, we certainly can get feedback. I guess it's up to you and your leaders on how you want that handled. Um, as Lynn had said, we don't anticipate a great deal of heartburn about any of this. This does give us some um, some clarity on moving forward. It's as many of you said, it's not a fix uh, for our financial woes, and we don't want to label it as that. But uh, it certainly will help, and hopefully gets you know a little momentum started at the Capitol. So um, I think we can get back with input fairly soon. Lynn, um, your thought. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, uh, we're careful to say these have not been approved. I think we're reflecting um, the staff's, what staff has communicated to us. And uh, we have a committee meeting tomorrow night. We'll give an update. And uh, if you get us that document soon, there's a board meeting next week um, and uh, should be able to move this forward quickly. Okay. Okay, good. I just, I wasn't sure if you had thought of, you know, just want to be mindful of kind of the lines between elected and um, kind of career staff, but it sounds like um, that may not be um, as, I guess, separate of a process as I might have imagined. So, yeah, um, when we say that document, are you referring to a combined document, the currently known as the Rudd and Elise documents? Um, minus one. Yeah. Okay. I think the least so, would like to work together to get a combined document that also reflects some of the input that we've gotten from this committee. At least okay. I'm happy to help any way I can. Excellent. Thank you. I'm sure I'll <laughs> take you up on that. <laughs> and we can look at those other two statutes I mentioned and, and maybe yeah. get yeah. back to the rut with a little more detail. Yeah, if those could be added, that'd be great. Thank you. And can we get, is there any documentation on those we can get that we can look at directly? Yep. Uh, uh, get yeah. yeah, that'd be great. And of course the chair. Cheers. <laughs> yes, um, perfect. Yeah, and I think, I mean, consider me as a resource if, if you need that. I know it's a quick turnaround, uh, but obviously um, you guys can kind of decide how to do that. Okay, so to answer the, the question, um, what are the next steps? The next steps are we need to create a combined document, um, add those two other statutes, um, and then get that over to um, RTD uh, staff and board members. Are we saying that we can get that done by the next board meeting? Is that too quick of a timeline or turnaround there? I guess, um we also need to get, if we're going to include the two provisions that RTD staff have flagged, then, I mean, I think that regardless of whether or not there's a, a finalized document before the board meeting, you know the four provisions we're talking about. You have the information, you have the two documents. I think that RTD staff and board can have a conversation over whether or not that makes sense and whether or not they want to add, suggest adding the other two. Uh, yeah. We'll try to, to finalize the merge document, but that should not hold RTD back because I think we're we're all w very well aware of what we're talking about. Right. And then we'll try to um, uh, create a consensus document from all of that, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I think we can discuss it tomorrow night. No problem. If you want an official position, you know, well, that's a, that's another week away. So um, we can okay. talk where we are. And, I guess I, I don't think we need to have RTD bless the accountability committee's documents. I don't even know if that's helpful because nope. then, right, we can we can remain independent. But we also we want a reality check with RTD. Ideally, we're all pulling on the oars in the same direction. So even if it's just verbal feedback that yes, there's no objection to this, we're we're on the right track. And gee, would you add a few more? Um, I think having an actual RTD position on legislation, if indeed it gets introduced and starts moving, um, would be highly appropriate. But I think it's okay if there's not a, a blessing of the accountability committee's document, because I, I don't know, that might be just a threshold that's not necessary. You know, um, I think that's probably true. The the committee's charter, is for lack of a better term, says that RTD, you know, when you come out with a report, the RTD board will either approve it or state reasons why it doesn't um, yeah. for any of your recommendations. So ultimately, you know, we need to jump through that hoop, but uh, it's not 
probably a critical rush. This report too, I would just mention, you know, is is uh, uh, interim and optional. The uh, committee's not required to do a report now. I think this is a perfect place. Personally, you know, I think this is a good place to start um, with the statutes. Yeah, and I think if we're able to get um, feedback and capture that um, from tonight's meeting, I think we're getting closer to kind of that joint um, kind of co-signed um, document, final document. So, but it, yeah, this it, we're, we're a separate committee that has to ultimately work within this system of RTD to implement some of these things. So it's kind of a fine balance. Um, any last thoughts? Uh, otherwise, I'm going to move forward with our next agenda items. Sounds good. Alrighty. Okay. Thanks, all. Um, I'm going to uh, hand it over to uh, Julie Duran Mullica. Duran Mullica, or is it Mullica Duran? Duran Mullica. Duran Mullica. Um, to yeah. talk about the governance model concept. Yeah, sure. So um, thank you. And I see that we only have about two minutes, so which is okay. I think that, you know, the time we spent discussing we the previous agenda. Hour. Was we have a half hour. Fiscal. Oh, we do. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thought we ended at 930. Okay, great. Awesome. Thank you. All right, cool. So um, I want to just draw attention to attachment C. Um, and, and really, this is just kind of to help us have a discussion on some of the ideas that are coming out of the governance um, subcommittee. Now, I do want to clarify um, that our previous meeting um, in the governance subcommittee was really just the presentation from LA Metro. We haven't really met again to unpack that or to actually discuss this document. So, you know, the timing was a little off, um, but I felt like it was still worth bringing this to the whole committee so that we could have the discussion. Um, and then that way we could, uh, you know, get your guys' input <laughs> and thoughts and then you know, we'll have um, more discussion on a subcommittee level. So it's, it's a little off, but, you know, we'll go with it. Um, so can I just ask for of, committee members to mute themselves? I'm, I'm hearing some feedback from, I'm uh, just not sure who. Chris, mute yourself. Chris, Chris mute yourself. His head needs <laughs> earphones on it. <laughs> Can staff mute him? I muted him. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, all right, so looking at uh, attachment C, and I just want to make sure, can we share that document, whoever's running this meeting? Or is the document being shared? I'm not seeing it on my screen. Sure, I can pull it up. Okay. Yep, give me just a second. I'll have that pulled up right now. Okay, awesome. Thank you. I just want to, because there's some good discussion points that Doug put in here, and so I want to make sure that, um, you know, everyone could just kind of follow along. Um, and so really the, 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 the point moving forward is how is it that we want to start thinking about um, what the governance of RTD could look like? And, and the main problem that has come up several times um, is including local involvement. Um, more into the, the process. And so how do we do that, I think is the question that uh, people are, you know, trying to grapple with. And that's why we're looking at all of these different models across the country. You know, we had, um, uh, we reviewed a matrix of all these different um, uh, different models of, of transit authorities. And then we had the meeting with LA Metro last week. So uh, we're just kind of shifting through all of the options and trying to come up with a discussion. So. Um, I guess the first point of discussion is, um, you know, the role or like, you know, talking about the RTD board of directors. So of course, you know, they're going to be setting the policy, adopting budgets, um, allocating resources to regional transit services, um, and then reviewing and approving sub-regional transit or local advisory councils. And so that is, uh, I guess, and, you know, I'm actually going to switch the conversation to the local involvement option because I think that could help with the board of directors discussion. Um, so if we're looking at how to include locals more in the process, there's kind of two options that we could consider. There's the, um, the Utah Transit Authority model, which is the local advisory council. 
Um, and then there's the sub-regional transit councils, which we heard from from LA Metro last week. And so I guess one of my questions would be, um, as folks have just kind of reviewed these bullet points underneath, the, the biggest difference between Utah and LA, from my perspective, is, you know, an advisory council provides a local voice, which is, you know, something that we, we really want, reviews and approves service plans, capital development plans and projects, um, TODs before um, appro approval of the board, represents and advocates the concerns of citizens on the board, versus the LA Metro process is really, um, I guess maybe a little bit more hands on with the service council model. So the membership actually includes local jurisdictions <laughs> within the RTD service area. So the membership could be um, people from, you know, that are local elected. I think they had um, their mayors appoint um, a number of people. And they could also include writers, um, members from nonprofit organizations, uh, really just a, a diversity of voices when it comes to uh, kind of like that local jurisdiction and what transit social supposed to look like. So the service councils develop local transit service plans. Um, and then obviously within um, RTD service goals and objectives, allocates resources to local transit services and can supplement services with local resources if desired. So essentially um, the sub-regional transit councils, I feel like, have a little bit more hand in what does transit look like for those regions. So um, when we think about these two different models and we look at the, the discussions that are going below, um, you know, I think what we're, what we still need to hash out as a subcommittee and what I'm hoping maybe to get your guys' uh, opinions on today is, you know, which model, um, pros and cons of different models, and then um, if you look up to the top of the document when we're looking at the RTD board of directors, definition of regional transit services. So the thought is if we go to one of these two models where we have more kind of local input, um, what does, you know, what does regional transit services mean for the RTD board to focus on versus local to focus on? Um, you know, we need to be thinking about, you know, resources needs for, for the various models. Um, and I think I'm gonna stop there just to get a little bit more um, of your guys' feelings and thoughts um, around this. I know my perspective <laughs> as a local elected, but I mean, I don't wanna <laughs> cloud it up. I'm gonna be open-minded about other people's opinions as well um, from option one or option two. Um, do we have any questions or comments that anybody has right now? Go ahead, Elise. So I strongly favor option number two, and I think it's important. I think Lynn is the one that, that always says this. we got to figure out what problem we're trying to solve first. The problem from, from my perspective is um, there's a lack of meaningful local input on funding decisions and on service decisions, and that uh, limits the... Um, effectiveness of the transit system and it serves to um, foster distrust. And I think turning this around is gonna need to be building trust and actually have meaningful input. And I, it's not that RTD doesn't ask us our opinion now, it's that we don't really have a seat at the table on really shaping the decisions. You know, we're asked to, rub, I don't say rubber stamp, that sounds pejorative, but to, uh, after RTD's already figured out what they wanna do, then they ask our opinion. And I think it should be reversed. So that's one. So I, I, I like option two and recognize that I think we should not adopt LA Metro's model. We should learn from it, but adopt something that works for us. Um, I, I do think that um, if we don't want to create a new level of bureaucracy, we could follow the Dr. Cog sub-regional tip model that already sort of exists. Sub-regions are defined as counties. So that works better in some places than others. So we might have to play with that. Um, but in defining what's regional and versus local, we might learn from the reimagine RTD process. They actually had three categories of a, a, a regional, sub-regional, and local level. I'm sorry about my barking puppy. Um, and we might see if we could figure that, and maybe that's, you know, regional um, routes are, uh, and services looked at, you know, by the RTD board first with, with some input from locals. 
sub-regional is a mixture, and then the local piece is, is driven by the local councils. Um, I, I also think that along with this is it needs to be some resource allocation from the 0.6 base system that allocates a certain amount of funding for the local systems um, that sub-regionals would be um, trying to make decisions around. I think the RTD board ultimately would have to bless what the sub-regions come up with, um, but there needs to be a resource allocation there, and that could be based on a number of factors. I think that this this memo outlines around you know population and employment, vulnerable populations, ridership, that kind of thing. Um, so anyway, those are my my initial thoughts on this governance model proposal. Rebecca, I thought I saw your hand up as well. Oh, thanks. Actually, Elisa's comments helped quite a bit. I was wondering how the um, RTD sort of more regional lines would fit into this. So. Okay. Anyone else have thoughts, Dave? Yeah, I just want to jump in. I, I feel like some sort of hybrid model almost between these two to make it very Denver-centric. <laughs> um, I don't know what that would actually look like, but I, I will say at first blush, the LA the LA model was very appealing to me um, when I think about trust across multiple levels. So from the community level to the government level to just state, probably even at the state level. Um, and just thinking about what is what is that real issue that we're trying to rebuild or what is that issue that we're trying to solve? Um, my only um, concern, or it's not really even a concern, but just something that I'm aware of, you know, in LA's model, they mentioned that in the first few years, it was very government centric as far as who com who was on the local service council. Um, and then it slowly started to shift towards more transit advocates and more of a community community representation. So that's just something for us to, to be aware of. Um, and if there's a way that maybe we can speed that process up a little bit, that would be my preference to get that equity um, voice at the table. Um, but otherwise, I, I'm personally just really intrigued by LA's model. And if it's a way to do a hybrid between Utah and, and LA, I, I'd be open to exploring that. Okay. Yeah. And when LA was doing their presentation, um, they did have like a, a membership slide that included, you know, the mayor appoints so many, or uh, I think like local government, elected local governments get, you know, a certain number of seats depending on, you know, the jurisdiction. And then the mayor is appointing, you know, like people who use transit, <laughs> you have to use transit to be on the, <laughs> the um, service council, um, nonprofit um, uh, representatives, you know, other of uh, diversity of folks. So like um, you could spell out how many seats belong to which category, essentially. So um, Chris, I saw you had your hand up. Chris, we can't hear you. We need to get Chris unmuted. I think he was, muted by the master controller. He should be unmuted now. He's self-muted on his end. Okay. Chris? There, there we go. Thanks. Um, yeah. Not sure what I was doing. Uh, I think the trust building is absolutely fascinating. I, uh, and and the, probably the most important thing that our, the, the RTD can do coming out of COVID. So it, it, designing around that makes all the sense in the world to me. I think there's a there's a risky balance though of creating a and I have not obviously been engaged in the the governance subcommittee but there's a risky balance of creating a constant need to report and seek feedback and almost in a way that ties the hands of um, of the RTD staff who are out trying to act and and move quickly so while we're simultaneously trying to free up RTD to be flexible I want to make sure we don't turn around and create a similar thing and a lot of you all have thought about this but i in option one it says reviews and approved service plans that that now adds another group of folks and maybe it works in utah i wasn't on that call but that adds a whole nother group of folks who are literally having to approve development plans projects budgets etc at every single whatever thing local advisory council actually consists of that's a whole that's a whole nother pot of of approvals that have to be acquired by staff and and so really it starts to create this crazy amount of 
um, of seeking of, of feedback that could really become an almost kind of endless loop. So um, I think we're trying to free them up to move. If, we, if we're if we not careful, we could end up creating something somewhere on the other side. So that's from somebody who has not been on this committee, so. No, thank you. I appreciate your perspective. I think that was helpful. Were there any other hands, Rhett? You know, it seemed to me that there were a couple of issues going into this that that I heard from from other sources that don't seem to have been directly uh, addressed yet, and and that is the size of the board. For one thing, it, it seems like a lot of these options. I looked at LA structure; it's amazing. This the size of that board can really be enormous, and uh, and so one of the things, if you want to get things done, you have to be sure that. You know there aren't 40 people sitting around a table uh, because everybody then doesn't get to hear have their voice heard because you, you there's a sort of an optimum size we have to be sensitive to of how we the the RTD board is the the other piece of this too is the issue of elected versus appointed the LA model there were a certain number of the people five I think it was that were appointed by the LA mayor and then there were others that came out of the council and there it was a fairly complicated hybrid model and if you're going to get local representation you you need to have some people that are picked by those communities but is an election the best way to do that or is it like the sub-regional council of governments uh, the model more like a dr cod model which i think might work better but I don't know. Uh, the, I'd like to. It'd be interesting to hear what our RTD board members think about this. If it's not too political and sensitive, <laughs> <laughs> Troy, I love your face. <laughs> Thank you for that uh, facial expression. It was great. <laughs> you guys don't have to jump in if you don't want to, but you're welcome right. to share your perspective. <laughs> You know, That's I, kind of an invitation you don't want to uh, receive, Rut. Thank you very much. Uh, no, I think the phrase is thank you very little. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, this has not been vetted much with the RTD board, so you know we don't have a lot of um, input. Uh, kind of in contrast to the legislative matters that we talked about earlier, um, you know, I I do. Um, have a little bit of the same uh, worries that, that Rhett mentioned about just, the, or maybe it was Chris, I think, the size and scope and delay, and that concerns me, but that's not something that is uh, prohibitive in, in moving it forward. But yeah, I, I, we really haven't had too many conversations in this regard, but I'm, I'm sure we will. And I'd welcome uh, my esteemed uh, colleague, Glenn, to comment as well, thanks. Yeah, I, um, as Elise said, you know, my, my first thought is what's the problem that needs to be solved? And, and um, you know, I think that Elise was right that the problem is, is uh, how RTD works with the local governments in terms of funding and um, service decisions. And uh, those decisions, you know, right now, I actually think it's kind of similar to what happens in LA. I think they took the service decisions back from the Locals, I could be wrong, but I think I heard this, the, the local service councils, they make the service decisions, that group reviews them, um, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, I think looking at, at how to fix the process, and um, as someone said, reimagine may have some, some feedback there. There's several options, I think, um, and uh, these are ones I kind of, you know, it, 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 I'm hesitant to see a whole new layer of decision making. Maybe that argues in favor of the sub-regional councils, or maybe it argues in favor of trying to figure out how to fix the process um, rather than creating a whole new uh, entity that that is doing some of this. Um, but as as Troy said, we're kind of uh, just starting to discuss this. It feels like. Uh, like uh, the accountability committee had took a while to sort of get moving procedurally and now that moving forward on many fronts including the eco pass and fairs and those things so um we'll be getting more on this but but i guess that would be my feedback is is uh you know let's make the process work and and uh 
try to do that without adding too much bureaucracy to the system. Thank you. Thank you both for, for your perspective. And, and yeah, this is really just, um, you know, a conversation that's developing in real time, it seems like, as we continue to be moving forward. And so, um, you know, as we continue to, to continue these conversations and tweak this, um, you know, and, and get more feedback, especially from our subcommittee, I think that that will help us um, figure out which direction we're going to go. Day, I see your hand up. Yeah, I mean, I just have a, a, a comment and a reflection as I hear the conversation. You know, one of the, the charges of the committee, or at least something that we committed to really early in our process, was um, committing to equity and how equity shows up. And I, I just want to encourage us, yes, this may be establishing more bureaucracy, but to what end, like, will it ultimately result in a more equitable system? Um, and not just geographic equity, but truly equitable for those that rely on public transportation to ensure that their voices are respected, are, are heard in a way that we aren't necessarily having to create more bureaucracy on the back end. And so that's just something that I wanna encourage us to keep front of mind as we, especially in, within the governance committee, start to really unpack these, um, that we're continuing to keep equity at the forefront. Yeah, and I agree, uh, Dana. I think that that is um, a very important consideration, especially when we're talking, well, I think it's essential when we're talking about this governance model, because the point is, is it's, I think it, it's important to clarify that um, local elected not only want to be more involved in this process, but um, we also need to allow um, our, you know, our writers in our community and as well as, you know, other advocates in our community to have a seat at the table as well. So it's not just about, you know, giving local electives what they want. It's about just um, diversifying uh, that feedback. And, and I think that that would make better transit systems in general when you have uh, a system that meets the needs of that particular community. Um, and so I, I agree with that statement. Um, and so one of the things that I wanted to, oh, go ahead, Elise. Well, I was just going to um, say, Daya, I totally agree. And um, I also, I think ways that equity are infused or could be infused in a local service council model would be one, figure out how to have actual um, uh, representatives from um, vulnerable populations be a part of those, which we need to sort of think through what that would look like. But having um, some allocation of some portion of the local allocation, part of the metrics of what how much <clears throat> council gets be direct be based on their population of vulnerable population members, um, and then also to have criteria around any um, local service decisions also have some criteria around equity. So there's several places where we could um, infuse equity to make sure that um, we can continue to lead with it. I would also just make the observation, what the discussion today is strictly about the local component, not about the RTD board questions itself. I think that's a separate topic um, and perhaps the local piece leads, which is why I think it's great that we're, we're starting with that. Julie. Yeah, go ahead, Crystal. Thank you. Um, ditto, echo, all of the, the good conversation around the equity piece. Um, I guess my, my clarification question is, are we talking about this being another layer or in lieu of a current structure, which to Lisa's point might move into a different conversation, but it almost feels like, I don't know, option two almost feels like a different structure uh, like a recommendation of an entirely different structure as opposed to in addition to, whereas like my just read is that option one kind of feels that way. So, or maybe we haven't drilled down that den that, that far yet, but maybe it's a um, point of conversation in the future. Yeah, and I think that, you know, the devils are gonna be in the details. Um, I do see option one as more of perhaps just like an, an added step or layer. Um, versus option two, I think does have or can include more structural differences. Um, I mean, I think that each service council, um, you know, they have 
dedicated staff? You know, how does that actually work? Um, so if you're going to be creating um, local transit-based systems, you know, do those how how are, how are staff resources going to be changed? Like I I feel like the option two does potentially have more structural changes versus just option one could be um, an added layer. But I mean, yeah, the devil the devil is going to be in the details of um, you know what what each of these options provide um, and how they're going to be operationalized, right? Um, and so that actually leads me to my next question, um, and I guess this would be for Doug or any of the staff on the, the phone, is um, so I, I, I see that you provided a lot of discussion topics, um, but one of the, the biggest ones that I am kind of curious about and I feel like we need to um, get more information around to, to better aid our discussion in which direction is most appropriate or which direction we'd like to move is um, determining the amount of resources for local transit services. So how do we um, determine what that looks like and what that amount is going to be? Um, you know, how do we put estimates around that? Because I think if we are gonna do like a sub-regional transit council, like this could uh, this could affect, you know, it, it, it's kind of like remodeling RTD's budget in a way because that money would go to different areas now. And how does that how does that work? And what is the I guess reality of those? So what are going to be the consequences of um, that type of model? So like, what is the reality of changing this model around, changing this funding around? Um, how much would so I, I live in Northland, so I was part of the Adams County um, TIP process. If we're going to follow kind of like those TIP sub-regional forums, which has been suggested because it's worked well in the past, you know, how much would that sub-region get? Um, and then obviously, especially among the local electeds is in those groups, is what would a, a local transit service plan look like? What, how much would it cost for us to develop our own, right? I don't think anybody has one in place. Well, that I know, but maybe somebody does. It's great. But, you know, in my region, we don't even have one. So what what does that even look like um, when it comes to actually making this come alive? So those are some of the questions that I have um, to figure out how, if we could move forward with either of these. Um, I think option one has less you know, implications in place. Um, it really could be, you know, implemented with um, creating the advisory council, right? And then just kind of talking about, you know, the, the process of approving or, you know, re reviewing and approving those plans, um, service plans and, and capital development plans and projects and things like that. Um, so it's, it's just an extra step. In the process versus sub-regional transit councils, I think provide essentially like a makeover. Um, and so it's I I I want to be realistic about what these options entail. And so um, Doug and staff, what are some things that we can um, do? Is this something that the consultant might be able to help us try and map out, um, or how can we get a little bit more information about um, the implications of of each of these steps? Julie, um, obviously all very, very important questions. And I've, I've written them down. I don't have the answers, but I've written down the questions for sure. And I do think there it's a good conversation for the subcommittee. A lot of these topics that you raise, um, we'll have a conversation internally too, to you know, kind of flush out whatever we can related to these questions for your conversations at the subcommittee. But um, but you're right though. I mean, this, as you suggest, these are just merely concepts, right? And you know the devil's always in the details, and and uh, we'll get we'll get down and get after it. Could I yeah, well, and we, add a suggestion? I, again, I I, I don't want to be the only one that wants to go down this road if nobody else wants to, but it might be helpful for the governance subcommittee to to really understand how um, the Dr. Cog regional sub regional model works because that gives you a concrete example of how it could work. I think um, as Daya pointed out, you would need to infuse it with um, 
representatives from the transit user community, and maybe you'd want to, you know, the RTD um, board member from that region. Yeah, I mean, you want to play around with the membership, but it's um, it, it's a fundamental shift in how resources are allocated, but it's not a whole lot of new bureaucracy. So it might be useful for the governance subcommittee members to be educated on that as a potential model. Yeah, we yeah, can provide that presentation. And I would also note that I didn't hear anybody speaking in favor of option one. So I guess I would encourage the governance committee to spend more time on fleshing out the options around an option two and what that might look like. Um, and Dr. Cog. Well, and I, I think Dr. Cog actually fits under option two. I mean, in, in the details of how you might implement it. Yeah. Go ahead, Brett. On the issue of, of uh, potential appointed members, you know, it doesn't have to all be just whoever that governor or whatever is making the appointments, whoever they like and want to put on it. You could have specific uh, uh, focuses for those appointments, like disabled community appointment, uh, uh, transit dependent communities appointment, and uh, local government appointment. So you could you could be specific in how you say not just whoever you want to put on it, but whether we can deal with some of the equity issues and the equity challenges by creating a focus for any appointed uh, uh, members. Agreed. Yeah, and that Either membership can be. Uh, please. Yeah, I'm that not membership can be. In particular, for a model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go ahead, Lynn. Um. I think um, that Julie, I think you raised some really good questions. There's a lot of, of devil in the details here. Um, and I think, uh, you know, you'll have to look at capital expenditures versus service. I think in terms of moving forward, it'd be helpful to have uh, some explanation from, from Jesse Carter and the service team uh, about, you know, why it's done the way it is. Cause then we got to figure out how, you know, to change it if that's, um, the committee's desire, and it sounds like it is, and, and uh, makes, I think it's a good one. Um, I, you know, you, you get into the issues around if, uh, you know, some of these uh, are local, it may be considered locals, but still pass through two or three counties. Um, uh, and I guess in terms of moving forward, I would suggest that. I would suggest that, um, you know, Euless Cleckley called in, obviously the city and county of Denver is critical to this piece. and. Uh, um, so bringing him or his team in, um, I think is a good step. And today we are welcoming uh, Deborah Johnson, who is the new CEO, the first woman CEO. And she comes out of LA Metro and Long Beach Transit. Um, LA is different from here because it does have all these individual providers and Long Beach Transit, I think is one of those. She's worked with a lot of innovative projects. So hopefully she may be able to give some good feedback too. Yeah, thank you for yeah. making that note. Um, team, we are about one minute out before we conclude. Um, any final thoughts? Okay, seeing none, uh, Julie, thank you for uh, guiding that discussion. I look forward to um, seeing how you develop that at the subcommittee uh, conversations. Um, before we adjourn, are there any other member comments or other matters from staff that we need to address? Okay. From staff. Nope. Okay. Hearing and seeing none, um, I'm going to call it, uh, I'm going to call the meeting. So thank you all, uh, and we are adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.